go ahead and get started. It's one o'clock, so um, I apologize. I have to stand up here because there's not a clicker for the board, so I will be awkwardly making that <laughs> screen. It's whatever. It doesn't really matter. So. Um, thank you guys all for coming. The bathroom, the nearest bathroom is right down the hall to the left, if you guys need it. If you would please put your phones on silent mode, that would be great. And then we also have question cards um, on the tables. We are going to um, have you guys, if you have a question, write it down. And then at the end, we're going to take all those questions and answer them. So we'll wait until the end for questions. Okay, so um, we'll start with introductions. I'm Dolly. I'm the director of the Moffat County Department of Human Services. Oh, Frank Moe, Moffat County Commissioner and lays on to Moffat County Department of Human Services. <coughs> I'm Nicole Schatz. I'm one of the child welfare supervisors. I'm Jack Hilbert. I'm from the state of the Colorado Department of Human Services. Um, I actually manage the child abuse hotline, and I'm also a former county commissioner, just here to provide a little bit of help and input and guidance if needed. Me? Oh, uh, I'm Amanda Ott. I'm the community sick care facilitator for Moffat County, as well as the local registrar for Moffat and Brown County. I'm Susie Coleman. I'm the ISST Family Services Coordinator at Northwest Colorado Pet. I'm Chelsea Hammer with Moffitt County Services. I'm Katrina Lilly with Moffitt County Human Services. Kaylee Barber, Moffitt County Human Services Finance Specialist. Ann Urban, Northwest Colorado Public Health Nurse. Amanda Arnold, Executive Director of Moffitt County United Way. Kristen Olson with Moffitt County United Way. Sarah Denson with Moffitt County Human Services. Pretty down, Moffitt County Human Services. I'm Carrie, the Unit Director at Boys and Girls Club. I'm Erin Daly, the WIC Program Director at Northwest Colorado Health. Crystal Baker, the AG Well Coordinator for Northwest Colorado Health. Stephanie Anderson, Chief Barber Officer at Northwest Colorado Health. <coughs> Melinda Cox with the Colorado Department of Human Services, the Division of Child Welfare. Lauren Hirschman, also the Division of Child Welfare and State. My name is Lindsay Nassworn, and I'm the Social Service Group of Human Services. <laughs> <laughs> Charity Resort, I'm also the Department of Human Services. Melissa Petrick, Human Services. Sasha Nelson, Craig Press. I will be taking photos here all the afternoon. Please ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chandra Patrick, Moffat County School District, and the school counselor at East Elementary. Okay, thank you guys. So, um, as you heard around the room, Moffat County Department of Human Services, we changed our name. Um, effective October 17th, the Board of County Commissioners signed a resolution um, for us to change our name. Um, and the reason we wanted to do that was to align with the Colorado Department of Human Services and to really just humanize the work that we are doing on a daily basis. So um, we wanted you guys to know about that. Um, the History on the Community Forum. So we started these about two years ago. Some of you might have been there. Um, and the reason we started those was with some changes in leadership. We have Nicole Schatz, the Child Welfare Manager, and then myself. Um, with some of those changes, we internally updated our mission and vision. That was a department-wide effort that everyone was involved in. Uh, we also have worked on an internal culture change. We've changed our organizational chart, our mission and vision. Um, we hire qualified staff that has a vested interest. And um, we have, as leadership, um, set Sorry. <laughs> um, we've set expectations for quality work and we make sure that we follow up on that to deliver. So uh, we've also had a shift in our values and practice, um, differential response, which Nicole can speak about. Uh, we work with the families, give the families a voice, and offer, we're working on offering preventative programs, which we'll talk about later. And then we also have um, an emphasis on customer service, which has recently um, been a very high priority for us also. Oh, sorry. Um, some of our goals for these community forums was to increase transparency, uh, educate the community on various issues that people are wanting to know about, and then to rebuild relationships, which we've been working on very hard for the last few years. 
Uh, topics of discussion today are mandated and non-mandated non programs, our budget and our funding, um, our performance from 2014 to current, and then if we have time at the end, we'll show um, a realistic job preview of what a caseworker's job is like on a daily basis. So mandated programs. On the left here, you'll see all of our programs that are mandated. And then on the right, you'll see the percent that they're reimbursed by the state. So if you look at adult financial, it's 80% reimbursed by the state. Home care, allowance, home, care, home care allowance, which is in adult financial, is reimbursed at 95%. So each of these programs have a different rate that they're reimbursed at. If you look at long-term care or SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, those are both reimbursed at 100% by the state. Um, and then you have Colorado Works, it's 100% reimbursed after the, the maintenance of effort is met, which is $62,000. So um, the county basically has to pay in the maintenance of effort and then it's met 100% after that. Um, some of our non-mandated programs are the Colorado Community Response, Community Services Block Grant, and Employment First. And I'll let Nicole talk about the CCR program. So the Colorado Community Response Program um, is actually a program that I think we're really excited and passionate about to have under our roof at Human Services. Um, Dolly and I wrote um, a grant uh, proposal and we were, the county was awarded um, the grant. It's 100% a, it's a covered by grant funding. Um, essentially the Colorado Community Response Program um, all of our referrals that are child welfare abuse and neglect referrals that are sent to the department, um, if they are not accepted for assessment, um, there's a few caveats. We're not allowed to refer um, custody issues or sexual abuse issues, um, re concerns, um, but all of those reports that are not accepted for assessment, meaning that the department's not going to be intervening in some capacity, are then referred to the Colorado Community Response Program. And that individual, Joyce, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, makes contact with the family and tries to engage them in services through the Colorado Community Response Program. Um, it's a great program, and the focus and the shift is really trying to help families um, work towards and mitigate some of those risk issues that we have brought to the department's um, attention that we may not be able to intervene on. And right now there's a big push on working with families to gain financial stability um, in order to reduce neglect. Um, and so we have had quite a few referrals already and we, we've had some system issues with our computer issues. And um, it took us a while to get up and running, but we currently have, I think, two families fully engaged and about 20 families that our CCR coordinator is currently working out, working on making contact with and trying to engage in services. It's completely voluntary and um, it can only be, um, CCR referrals can only be made by the Department of Human Services. Um, unfortunately, that's just part of the, the uh, referral process. However, there is um, a small caveat in that if, if the CCR program has worked with a family, and they've closed out services for one reason or another, a family can come back and re self refer if they decide they want to engage in services. So um, we're really excited about this program. And um, we have some flex funding to help with um, pressing issues that we may not be able to get services for somewhere else in the community. So we're excited to see where that program will take us. Thank you. Um, another program that we currently have that's not mandated is the Community <coughs> Services Block Grant, which um, effective January, United Way will be taking that over. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's a great program that has helped out our community. It was reimbursed 100%. Um, there was a lot of administrative functions that we had to do with that program, and um, we felt like that might be better utilized by another agency in our community. So. Um, we partnered with United Way and they are graciously taking it over and going through all the paperwork. Um, and then we had Employment First, um, and that was a program that was only reimbursed about 50% by the state. And that was a, that was a work-related program. If you didn't have an exemption, um, if, you were on uh, if you were on the SNAP program or food assistance program, 
and you did not have an exemption and you were able-bodied, then you were required to work X number of hours depending on your benefit. Um, due to the administrative burden and the um, lack of funding in that program, the Board of County Commissioners in December of 2016 um, decided that it would not be feasible for us to continue with that program, and so it was discontinued in December of 16. So those are the only three non-mandated programs that we've had in our budget in the last two years that we were providing. Our total overall budget is $5.7 million. The county contribution of that is 7.5% or $437,000. Um, so our return for, for the county investment is over, over 12 times. Um, so our total state and federal allocation is $5.3 million. That's, that's $5.3 million coming into our community and the county is only responsible for 437000 of that. Um, so what happens to our money when we get it and we don't spend it here locally? So the, the big 10 counties, that would be um, Douglas, Larimer, Denver. Um, no. Oh, no. You'd think they would be because they keep growing and growing. Well, they are not spend. They're, they're number 11. They're <laughs> number 11. <laughs> okay. Well, the 10, the 10 big counties, um, they overspend their, their allocations every single year. And, and as small and medium counties that don't overspend our allocations, um, that money goes back to those counties to offset their over expenditures. And Jack is here, he's a former Douglas County Commissioner, and he can kind of explain to you how us small and medium counties have helped out those larger counties that overspend every year. Thank you, Donald Merrill. Um, don't think I always want to point out, as a former commissioner, and I was in Douglas County, I was kind of a few years back, um, one of the things we realized is what, it was a fantastic effort for us when we understood, hey, we need to provide services to our community. So let's look at this a little different. You saw a slide a while ago that said, you invest 487,000, the state and feds will give you 5.7 million. Let's change that formula just a little bit. And let's say, if you gave me $4, and I said I would turn around and give you 50, what would you do? I think you'd take advantage of that opportunity, wouldn't you? If I restricted it and said you could only spend it on gas and groceries, what would you do? Break my heart, here's your $4, okay? You'd do it again, okay? And so the point is, is that it's a great opportunity as long as you use it. What we have to get out of our mind is not spending part of that $5.7 million difference is not a savings to you. It just means money you can't spend here. And any money you can't spend here hits you two ways. It hits you two ways, well, three ways. We always looked at it, and as commissioners, we would talk about, you know what? Our job is to bring back your tax dollars, and these are your tax dollars as a citizen, because many of you in this room are citizens also, that we're bringing back your tax dollars and we're gonna put them to work in our community because the feds in the state doesn't ask you, give it to us, and then, no, they take it, and then you get an opportunity to get it back, okay? So this is an opportunity for the commissioners to say, you know what, we recognize we can bring back money to our taxpayers, bring back their tax dollars and put it to work here. So a lot of people have this thing, well, $5.7 million, let's cut that budget. Well, we recognized that some counties were doing that, and we were saying, oh, interesting concept, great, don't spend it, because we're going to spend it. What that means is simply this. If there's money left in the pool and is left over, and Melinda is the finance group, so if she needs to step in, jump right in, please. So if there's money left over, what we used to say is, you know what, guys, we'll take a risk. We'll just take a risk. So we see we want to give our, our community extra services. We want to provide a greater safety net. We want to provide some more services for people who are in need. We would say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go ahead and allow you to overspend by 100000 Knowing that history and trending would probably mean that we could recoup that at the end of the year from the state because it would be left over in the pool because <coughs> some counties weren't spending it. So in reality, the counties don't know spend those dollars we're subsidizing us. And we thank those counties very much. But anyhow, <laughs> what Dolly and the commissioners here have recognized is, oh, that's not a good thing. Because in reality, what they're doing is they're giving, when that happens, it's your tax dollars that's going to another community. So that's why you're here today. Part of it is, guys, they want to put programs in place. They want to do things and they need your support to help you. That's what we did. We said, you know what? We're going to make sure we spend what we've got 
And if we overspend a little bit, that's okay too, because you know what, there's just a chance we might get more at the end anyway. And so we're just gonna follow this rainbow to the golden top. And so that's how we approach it. But here now becomes the next element. I wanna just, just remind you of as we close on this whole issue there. You know, when you spend money in your community, we also, this is crazy, but we looked at it as an economic development tool. But Douglas County does quite well economically development-wise. I mean, we really are, we have done quite well. But what we recognized early on was for every dollar we spent in our community, from, from any standpoint, you spend it here, it flips twice, okay? So it's a two to one return on top of the 11 to one return you just got. So let me just say it, you've just spent $400,000, $450,000, you got in 505.7 million. If you spend that 5.7 million here on more resources, people, services, community efforts, partners, that means that money's gonna flip twice again. The net effect is you're talking about, about a $12 million economic impact. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Folks, it really is. So I highly, highly recommend that you guys, I think Dolly and them are putting together programs and they're looking for support. Take a look at that kind of stuff. And the commissioners are really looking at it from that standpoint too. And I applaud their efforts because I think what they're saying is we're bringing our taxpayers' dollars home. We're not going to be supplying them out to other counties and subsidizing them. Now, I'm not a commissioner anymore, so I don't have to worry about going home after just telling the secret. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to worry about that a whole lot. But at any rate, I just want to bring that point home. So think about it in the simplest of terms. It's your tax dollars they've brought here. Don't let your tax dollars go to another county. Implement the programs necessary to provide the safety net you've got and your economy will benefit as a result. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Frank, do you have anything to add? Just a couple of short um, stories prior to um, Jack coming. Was it two months ago that you all came? We were having, as a, as a county and as, as the, the city, we were having budget challenges not of our own making but because of the devaluation of our um, economic um, real estate tax the county is basically a real estate tax funded entity that from those real estate taxes we're able to offer the services to the um, community so the city's had a challenge we've had our challenge we've been working on um, reducing our budget two and a half million dollars and the reason was we were receiving two and a half million dollars less because of the valuation of all of the commercial properties and the houses and and that has gone down that uh, much which we did not have um, a control of so when we've been looking at um, our staffing levels and our different um, departments, our elected officials and that, questions were coming of why are we with social services <laughs> not eliminating positions? And a good portion of our um, answer was until Jack came, we were struggling to give well-informed and reasonable answers you know, to them. But when you look and see again that these services are mandated, there are, a lot of them are mandated by the state and some of them are federal and when you look at most of the programs are between 80, 90 and 100 percent re, um, reimbursed, it's, it's a natural but when a fellow commissioner came and met with us and the other two commissioners and said you're taking the wrong approach, you should be standing up and be, be proud of the fact that you've got a great human services department that is taking care of and again a lot of you all work together you know as, as an entity taking care of our social needs but from a from a department of human sources there they're offering the services that we're required to do they're working with all of you they're working with the public and we're making social changes and helping those people but when jack <laughs> you know made the comment that yes look at it that you're doing your job you're offering the services you're helping the families you're helping you know the children but look at it from an economic development standpoint so we <laughs> were asked as commissioners to go to a different um, two or three different um I'm trying not to use anybody's names <laughs> 
a couple of groups called us on the carpet and said, why are you cutting here? Why aren't you cutting here? And why is this um, different or special? Well, with the training that we got from Jack and a better understanding, even being new commissioners, we're able to, to, to say, they're doing an excellent job on taking care of the people of Moffat County and again working with a lot of the other ones, but from an economic point, we are returning about 13 times the amount of money that the county is, you know, has um, invested. So it's a win-win-win. The people needing, social, needing services are winning. Our community is, you know, winning and that's one of our biggest things you know, doing is we need a strong economy and we need, you know, to be doing those things that are within our, you know, control and perfect example of when you're an elected official and you're dealing with people's tax money that we're sending to Washington, D.C. and to the, to the um, state, it's our job to get as much money of that back, you know, here and they're doing an excellent, you know, job at it and we're, you know, proud <laughs> to say that we support all of the different entities that are helping in the community's social you know, challenges, but the people that are employed, they're buying houses, groceries, and that, that it is a giant you know, economic boost to our um, area. Great, thank you. thank you. So in the last five years, how much money do you guys think that the Moffitt County Department of Human Services have given back to counties like the county Jack came from? 100,000, 300,000? Maybe five hundred thousand. Melinda, would you like to come up and um, yes. kind of explain what we've done in the last five years? So I started working with the state when I was twelve. So I've been in my county a long time since then. And over the years, I'm seeing um, how the community and the department has really evolved. Um, when I started working at the state and coming up here um, quite often, I actually have family living here as well, so it was kind of nice. Not anymore because I divorced my family, but anyways. <laughs> so, um, we had a prior, you had a prior administration here that um, was, had really good intentions, however, when about community service and serving their commu your community and keeping your services here, not in a positive way. It didn't turn out to be a positive. She, I, I believe that that person really thought that the intent was good. But at that time, social services was really kind of an island, right? And and she and this prior administration kind of built a moat around that around social services and the community and the families were kind of on the outside of that moat. And the way that not these commissioners, but the way that this person communicated to the commissioners is that. Every dollar we don't spend is cost savings. We're not spending dollars. And that's not true. The Department of Human Services gives dollars, provides dollars, provides funding for you to invest in your community. And that's invest in your community. And if you don't, lose, if you don't use that, those, fun, those funds, you lose those funds. And actually, you lose those funds, but Douglas County gains those funds. And that's exactly what you don't want, right? So I feel like with this community and really being educated to make informed decisions has evolved over the last three, five years to really look at your community and what's best for your children and your families here and investing here. Just like when a child welfare unfortunately has a, an out-of-home child, we have to put, place a child in out-of-home placement, which we call congregate care, which really doesn't mean anything, but when you say out-of-home placement, you really know that you're taking a child away from their family, from all that they've known, and if there's nowhere to put them in this community, you put them in Denver, you put them in Pueblo, you put them in Mesa. Every time you do that, you spend money in another county. You're giving another county money. Where does that youth or where does that child come back when they grow up and get out of congregate care or out of that home placement? They come right back here because this is where their community is. This is where their family is, right? And so if you invest in your community and make sure that you have out of home placements here, you have foster placements here, then you're keeping those kids, those youth, here in a safe and stable environment, but you're investing here in your community. So what we've tried to do is really educate and inform not only the, community, the, the county commissioners, but also the department in saying, if you spend this money here, your economy is going to grow. Your children, your families, your community is getting healthier and healthier. That draws more and more people that want to want to live in this beautiful area with your beautiful mesas in Craig, Colorado, right? 
So when you look at the allocation, so the, the program that I administer is core services program. It's $54 million statewide. There's no other state in the, in the country that has this type of allocation that is for 100% therapeutic service delivery, right? Other states have this program called Promoting Safe and Stable Families, and we too have that in Colorado. It's about $3 million statewide. But Colorado and its legislature believe so, so heavily on therapeutic service interventions that they have outlined in the Long Bill its own line item called the Family and Children's Programs, and it's $54 million statewide doesn't go to child protection workers, doesn't go to case aides, doesn't go to intake, it goes to 100% therapeutic service delivery for your children and your families. Why that's important is um, in 2014, we also passed legislation and then rule that allows counties to spend money on families that do not have an open child welfare case. Now why that's important is because this legislation allows counties to now spend their child welfare block, which is a lot of money, and their core services allocation, which is $54 million statewide, on families and children that have a need of a service. So a lot of times when human services screens out a referral or maybe closes an assessment or even closes a case that no longer has safety or risk involved, they can offer a support plan. They can refer to a service so that these families can get a service without having an open child welfare case because who wants to develop a child welfare case, right? Nobody does. But you all in this room are so vital and so important to the success of not only human services, but to your community here in Moffitt County. And that's why in the last two years, these community forums have been informative and educational and really a way to strengthen your community because it's not just human services you know, responsibility. It's the entire community responsibility to invest in your community. Don't give up the $830,000 in the last five years that you've given to Douglas County. Keep that in your community, invest in, invest in your service delivery, invest in your safety net, and invest in your, your children of the leaders that are going to be the leaders here tomorrow. Because history has proven that a lot of your families are generational here, and they want to be here with their families, with strong services in, the, in a community sense. Questions? Okay. Any questions? Is that you know, amazing? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I feel like clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so our plans to spend this money in the future and what we're doing now, I'll have Nicole go ahead and explain some of these things. Okay. So I'll just give a brief rundown. So the prevention services is what Melinda was talking about a few minutes ago, um, where we are able to provide services to families where there aren't active safety concerns, but they need some sort of intervention to help the family kind of move along in a positive direction. Um, and we started that about two years ago. Um, it's, been, it's been an option for several years, and um, when I became one of the child welfare supervisors, that was one of my main priorities, and Dolly's as well as the director, because we really recognized that there was this need. Um, currently, we have about 34 open um, prevention ca um, service cases. Melinda doesn't like that term, but um, we provide families, 34 families, with some sort of service. Um, and it's wonderful because they are getting the services they need and they don't necessarily have to have human services in their lives. Um, the other program that has been up and running for about a year now um, is in collaboration with the Mob County School District and Mind Springs Health. Um, Craig Thornhill really drove this program and I think made it happen and um, he supplies or he ha has hired a um, full-time, no, three-quarter time um, therapist to work primarily with um, at-risk youth and a lot of these youth are at risk for being placed out of home. So we're really trying to catch those kids who are having difficult behaviors in the community, at school, and um, that clinician's really working with the family. Um, they, they have family therapy weekly, they have individual therapy weekly, um, the clinician goes to court hearings, and then um, the department currently funds 10 slots or 10 kids and their families. Um, and so we have an open voluntary case with the family, um, and there's a caseworker also involved with the family to kind of help with any crisis that may arise, attending court hearings, being supportive with the family. 
Um, and so that program's, I think, been really beneficial, and we've been able to keep a couple kids in our community because of that program. Um, another program that we've had kind of off and on, and we've decided to start back up this year, is Love and Logic, and it's a parenting program. Um, we will be doing that in collaboration with um, uh, Connections for Kids, and Charity Reeser is trained to facilitate that um, program, and I believe there's one starting in January, and January 30th. And one in the spring as well. And there are flyers on the tables for you guys to see. Um, and that program is, um, that parenting program will be free to the community. So anyone who wants to participate. Um, we also have a family engagement facilitator, which is also charity. Um, the department has um, really recognized that family engagement meetings have been incredibly beneficial for our cases that we currently have open. Every family that um, it has a voluntary case or um, an active case where there's court involvement um, participates in a family engagement meeting every 30 days, or uh, I'm sorry, every three months. And the, the goal of that family engagement meeting is really to have the family at the table, um, their supports at the table, and any other parties who are important um, and involved with that family to help make decisions, to engage the family in what's going to work best for them and motivate their change process. Um, and it's really kind of to help make sure that cases don't get stagnant and we're providing families with what they need. Um, and I think that that's incredibly beneficial for a lot of families. And the newest thing that the department is working on doing is um, we currently have a request for proposal out. Um, and we are trying to obtain a contracted in-house therapist who will work with our families that we currently serve in the child welfare um, side. So um, a lot of times there's delays in getting families into therapists, um, there's scheduling issues, so we are trying to um, mitigate those delays and really bring that service under our roof and have someone who is more accessible to families. So um, we're hoping, we have a wide, net of what we would like to have our dream and and we recognize that we're not going to get everything we ask for but we would really like to have someone who could work with our families who are um, dealing with trauma and substance abuse issues and um, some of our teens that are really struggling and, and that's kind of our hope there thank you Next, we will talk about our CSTAT performance. I'm going to have Lauren Leah come up and see. I'm tell you guys a little bit about it. Um, so CSTAT is um, at CDHS the way that we um, try to use data to inform outcomes and help improve processes. And so CSTAT um, data is collected um, all the time and compiled monthly. And each and, and by county, so each county gets a CSTAT report every month. Um, that data is aggregated at the state level, so that the state is looking. Um, so CDHS is looking at, for example, how is the balance of state doing? So how are the smaller counties doing? And breaking that out by county as they need to. Um, and there is data across every type of work that human service or human services. Do. So I know you guys got a, a handout. <coughs> which is good because up here it gets real small. But um, this first page right is economic security. So these are the measures that apply to economic security programs and human services. The next page has safety, um, which has more to do with child and adult protection services, which I'll talk more about in a second. There's well-being data. Um, what else is on here? Oh, yeah. Okay. I see the yeah. So, and... Where these measures come from um, is sort of depends on the measure, but we're mostly trying to align them with what are federal required outcomes, as well as what are outcomes that really get to family child level outcomes. So this is why I really want to talk about safety. Um, timeliness is how soon are we responding to a referral? So if I get a referral in and it's an immediate concern, and, which means I need to respond within eight hours or by the end of the business day, How? what percentage of those cases am I doing that? Because we know that if we're supposed to see a kid today because it's an immediate concern, we don't see them until tomorrow or the next day, that directly impacts potentially child safety. So many of these, especially these safety measures, 
are really those trying to get to those child and family outcomes. Uh, and so, if you can go back a slide, actually. So how they have this set out is they, for each measure, there's the 2014 average, and this is for Moffat County, correct? Okay. The 2015 average, the 2016 average, the current performance, and the goal. So, you'll see these are really high goals. This is saying 95% of the time you need to be doing this timely, uh, or whatever the, I guess all of those are timeliness until the end. So that's a really pretty high bar. Um, and when we're in small counties, we're talking about not very many numbers. So in Douglas County, right, we're talking about hundreds. And so if you miss one, you're still at 99%, right? The numbers here are much slower. And so if you miss one, that impacts your percentage a lot. So you can see here, we, I'm, I'm glad that you put the different years because it shows the, the, um, the increase in performance. And there are very, very, very few counties who have this many hundred percents. I know Lake County is one, I know Park County is close, but there are, I, there are very few that have this many hundreds because it only takes one to <coughs> one. So this means every single one of those is being completed. You'll see there's a couple that's a zero, which is good because the goal is less than 21%. So every now and again, you see zero and you're like, hold on, this is bad, but it's not, we have to look at what the goal is. Let's go to the next page. Again, this is, this is huge um, because the, the goal, some of these 98% and then 90% gives a little more wiggle room. Um, but again, Moffitt County has been 100% this year. Um, one I really, well, I guess before I go further, do you guys have any questions about the specific measures? I know it's a lot of information. I don't want to go through every one. But are there any measures that you're wondering, what does that, what does that mean? And if you don't have them now, Nicole and Dolly know everything. So <laughs> they can also talk about public schools. Yeah. I, I'm just curious, what all have you guys been able to do differently mm -hmm. um, when you look from 2016 to now? Those are big, big changes. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. that's coming later. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, I, I will say this, hopefully I'm not taking any, but generally when folks work to improve these measures, it has to do with internal processes. So how, what the steps you take as you're working through a case or working through an assessment. And, and so it takes a lot of time. Um, as a state, when we first started looking at um, like the assessment closure, we had some that had been open for like two years because they were stuck in our data system where Nicole had tried to close them. I know it was Nicole, but Nicole's person in her, in her role had tried to close it, but I got stuck in the system. So we also had to like solve some kinks on our end that's even out of the county to, to work with some of those. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, Nicole, you want to Okay, before I move on, I do want to talk about this, this one, congregate care. Um, the state goal is less than 6% of kids in congregate care. Moffitt is at 24. You are not alone in this. This is a really challenging measure, and this is the federal goal. So this is the federal expectation for what percentage of kids. What's the denominator? All kids in the community or all kids Good involved question. in social services? All, all altered and in out of home care. So children who have been removed from their biological family, and the county has custody and are living elsewhere. So they may be living with a grandmother, they may be living with a foster parent, they may be living in a group home. But they, what's your, um, yeah, so, so all kids in the community or all kids that have had contact with social services, how do you get the denominator the denominator is the bottom side, the child kids and child welfare, those in, come in out of home placement is the numerator, which is No, it's is. all kids in out, out of home, home care is the denominator, that's the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> the top number is the number of children in this certain type of care called congregate care. So out of family placement. Yeah, out of family placement. You're so perfect. not even kinship placement. Correct. Family. It would be a group home. It would be a residential treatment center. This is social work language, right? But foster care. Say that again. Foster care. Mm -hmm. No, foster care is not. That's not. Mm -mm. Congregate care would not. Depends on the number. If it's out of, if it's out of county. Mm -mm. Okay. Because so foster care is. A, I kind of think about it as, as a family-like setting. So is it me and maybe one or two other kids 
and uh, one or two caregivers, that's not congregate care. Congregate care is where I'm in a facility and there's staff who rotate. So overnight I work with one staff person, there may be six kids, there may be 100 kids, but there's staff coming in, and so it's less of that family life. And that's what we are saying, so, like investing in your community, having more foster care placements in your community, keeping those kids here, mm -hmm. keep the congregate numbers down, and then increase your um, investing in your community so those kids don't go out of county in a, a facility yeah. replacement. Yeah. And if I can, I think yeah. with the congregate care, we were just looking at the commissioners, I think right now we're paying $50,000 a month for congregate care that we have right now. It's 51,000 so, yes, yeah. For how many kids? That for That's for eight kids. Okay. Well, no, the total was um, 16 kids. Eight, eight of those are in congregate care. care. So and there are 16 the kids. And mm -hmm. Adam eight. Do we have well, any congregate care here? We don't have no. congregate care here, no. So, so that's out of county, some of those conversations. And I will say, this is hard. Um, this is not an easy thing. Because generally, the kids we're talking about are kids who may also be involved with criminal activity. They may be involved in substance use. Um, they may be kids with pretty significant behavioral concerns, so uh, or mental health concerns. So this is not easy. <laughs> um, it takes... Um, when we're looking at decreasing the kids in congregate care and having them be in family like settings, it's really thinking about the, the package of services that are also wrapped around the family. So what supports are the foster parents given um, to help manage behavioral concerns? Um, is there like the day, a day treatment program is a great way um, because these kids may not be able to go to school anymore and may need to go to therapy and have intensive substance abuse treatment. So if they can go to day treatment, does that open up more options for in-community services? Um, so, so that's why I really wanted to point this out, because this one is one where I know lots of folks talk about it. I know they talk about it a lot at ISST um, and with probation folks, because it's this, these are the kids who have a lot going on in their lives and a lot of challenges and need a lot of support. So, Other questions on that? Oh, there's more. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I knew there was more. This is comparing Moffitt to uh, the other 44 small counties. Just to really emphasize um, how phenomenal um, they're doing. Um, in every single measure, oh, go back. In every single measure, they are above um, the performance of the 44 small counties as a whole. Yes. Except for the cases with the rears, right? Where's that one? At the very so, bottom right there. Yes. But so so the, you so want it to be less, right? No, you no, this is one, so that, sorry, the white is where they're meeting the goal, the non-white is where they're not meeting the goal. So right. the, these two, they are not, they're close. This one's so close. Right, but the one below that. Pass them a right. little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So the, and that's a rear says in child support. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Yeah. So the, like the current child support. support. Yes. Current yes. child support collected, we are outperforming like your the eyes. four small counties. You got it. <laughs> She's like, I know what that means. So yes. What do you do for a small county? Because for ISSP and allocations and stuff, we're considered a medium sized county through CMP. So, and yeah. those to number of youth and stuff. So, how does that, yeah, how does that correlate? That's a good question, Melinda. Do you know? Because CD, I know CSTAT does it based on child population. Sure. And, and, so we and have the big ten. It is a really difficult conversation because they may have a program, they do small, medium, large, and then some allocations are just ten large amounts of state. So um, it looks like this. I think there's some medium. Yeah, medium medium there's only a few. It, be, it looks like there's ten because there's yeah. twenty missing. Yeah. Right? So there's ten medium counties and then there's ten large, ten, ten large counties. And forty-four that are considered small based upon child population. Mm -hmm. And I know also when, when they were looking at CSTAT initially, they were also looking at, and, and why I think Moffitt falls into the small, is because the, the number of cases that they're um, working with is much more similar to other small counties rather than the medium counties. But, yeah. Yes, I have a question. And they're looking at the cases with the arrears. Yeah. So not where we would like to see it. Yeah. My question is, those cases are not necessarily cases that are involved in the system overall. 
Correct. Yeah, this could be. Is there some place to get those numbers, like where that is? Because I'm not coming from. I'm not coming from working for the county or a county-funded position. So I'm looking at people who are not in the system, and that's the one that isn't meeting the goal. Yeah, that's it. Because if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, right? There's there's people who may be in arrears of child support who also may be um, working with Colorado Works or maybe have an open child welfare case, right? Yeah, and I, I think that that's when I was seeing the numbers that were in the paper. That was it. Kind of twists it a little bit because mm -hmm. you're seeing 1,900 cases, but those cases are probably in three different programs. Or no program at all. Maybe the program's closed, exactly. but they still have arrears based upon having had some assistance throughout the life of their Right. Program. So, I so guess my question was, do we actually know what those numbers look like rather than... And Dolly can get that information from our state, from Larry and Adrian. She's like, we, we, actually, actually we have no way to pull a report that shows duplicate programs for the child support. They, they have different systems. Hmm. But, they do, but they do have a CDMS match that can tell them if, they've been, if they're currently on or not. Because I think... Is that currently. Cur that currently have an open case and CPMS, which would be Medicaid, SNAP, basic assistance, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're not open, then, they, then the remaining that don't have any, that doesn't have any open are non-public assistance cases, but still arrears because they had one open at one time. We can look into that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and some of these, right, could be they've been in arrears for 30 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're still in open case. Yeah. 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 So good. Other questions? <clears throat> um, and I really appreciate that that you guys are handing this out. I know um, that really wanting to have transparency about performance, um, and especially because some of these issues, like children under care, is something that's hard to solve in a vacuum. Right. I know the woman from United Way asked about how do they fix these. With this, this is something like assessment closure. It was really about them mapping out their processes and figuring out how to make things more efficient. But something like this, there's a lot of players. Um, and so it just gets trickier. So good questions there. Yeah. Thank you. And then uh, a couple weeks ago, I got an email from Randy Mary, who's the performance management director at the state. And um, this is the letter that I got the email. It says, congratulations, Moffa County has been selected for a CSTAT award for their performance on the child welfare timeliness of immediate initial response to abuse and neglect assessments. Um, so the Division of Child Welfare and actually the director of Colorado Department of Human Services is coming out to Moffa County to celebrate with the child welfare team um, this accomplishment. This is huge. We've never had this before for our department. <laughs> There are a few staff members that really played a big part in this in this award that we're getting, so I would like to acknowledge them right now. Um, Nicole Schatz, Casework Services Manager, Charity Reserve, Family Engagement Facilitator, and formerly um, Casework Services Manager, Chris McKenzie, Lead Caseworker, Michelle Whiney, Social Caseworker 2, Marky Green, Social Caseworker 2, Starla Jensen, Social Caseworker 2, and Renee Nelms, Social Caseworker 1. So thank you guys very much. So what affects our performance? This is where we get to the question that was asked. And go ahead, Nicole. So I've actually spent some time thinking about this. Um, and there's a couple levels. Um, it was really interesting. Um, I asked the team yesterday about this slide specifically because I didn't want to put words into their mouths. Um, and I kind of got like stares back. And, um, the responses were because it's an expectation and um, I know if I don't do it I'm gonna get an email from Nicole that says just a friendly reminder um, which really means please do it um, but I went home and I thought about that last night um, and one of the things that I really thought about was um, yes it's true it's an expectation for our team but it's always been an expectation for our team and um, one of the things is um, that I don't think people realize is that child welfare is a very difficult um, job to have. Um, the burnout rate is incredibly high. Um, you know, I think they say about 18 months 
and um, you know people either decide to stay in it or leave and that's a really short time to learn a job that has so much weight to it um, and and so thinking about that and knowing that when I came into this position one of the things that I was really important to me was trying to make the, the position as flexible as possible and to solve some of those things as a caseworker that led to my frustration and being burned out and um, myself along with other team members um, not being able to get the expectations of our job done um, and a couple of the things that um, we created when, when taking over this position was having a little bit more flexibility in the jobs as much as we can. There's certain guidelines and restrictions that we have to abide by, um, but trying to um, be flexible with our staff, I think, has gone a long way. So um, our on-call schedule has shifted from being weekly to half a week to daily, um, which has helped because um, the team's able to kind of move and arrange their schedules versus not being available to attend to their own lives for a week at a time. Um, a couple other things that we have gone to is working for tens. Um, the staff has been given the ability to work for tens, and um, I know for myself it, it gives me motivation to get more done um, because I really appreciate that extra day. Um, and then we've really just tried to hire staff um, that I think fit well with our team and um, really focusing on having um, staff that are educated and have the skills to work with families um, or are able to learn those skills versus having a warm body which um, I'll be honest prior to starting um, this position there were there were times where people were hired because they had the qual they met minimal qualifications and um, it was someone and so I'm really thinking about who we bring into our team um, because that affects the work we do with our families um, and then another thing that I've really thought about um, is that um, one of the things that we've really focused on in the last couple years is doing um, our quality practice teams and every month we get together and we look at our C stat to see kind of where we're at and then we start to map out um, things that either we need to work on and improve and really looking at our internal process and how we might be able to shift or move things around um, to kind of increase performance or even sometimes looking at what we are doing well and mapping out why is this working well and what can we continue to do to make sure that it continues to run well. Um, so I think those are really the big things. I know that we've really focused on recruiting outside of the county because we don't have a lot of individuals who um, have the, the minimal requirements for the position. Um, and we have hired people um, out of state and they're still, I mean, two of our individuals are out of state. One actually lives out of state and commutes here. Um, and and um, we really value her. And so we've kind of reached out. Can, can I add something? I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I think add to the performance, I think these non-mandated programs that Dolly and Nicole have worked really hard on the grants and things like that have also added to that because it allows the caseworkers, like for example, um, the program area three services, prior to that program, it would have been a voluntary case. So you would have had to meet with that family monthly, you would have had to have a treatment plan, you would have had to have family meetings and perhaps just for like a risk type thing instead of a safety concern. So adding some of these non-mandated programs have really freed up um, time for the caseworkers to, to focus on more of that really like um, extreme child safety or other areas. So um, I, again, I think that adds to the performance is that Dolly and Nicole have worked extremely hard on um, those programs that are not mandated and they see the value in those, so I think that is also helped. What, what an interesting thing in this to the commissioners, but also um, like to acknowledge you have to have the right team leader. She's done a wonderful job with all of these people. Excuse me, this is, this is emotional, because one of the things before, um, 
the commissioners had the opportunity to work with Jack, look at these numbers, look at the um, performance, but one thing that hasn't been discussed, and they're being kind, we had an employment freeze during this time. So they were down three and four people at a time, and they were able to do this you know, performance. Jack came and you know, helped educate the commissioners on you know, just what we had previously talked about. So thank you, great team leader. Thank you, great team. But they were also under an employment you know, freeze. So now they're getting back to where they're fully staffed. Well, and I'll say to the credit of the caseworkers, they really took the brunt of that. And, um, and I think um, that they know that we have expectations, but I also think there's some internal motivation um, that maybe hasn't always been there with other staff in the past. And um, I really appreciate the team that we have. They all work very hard. And I think that goes back to we hired the right people. We have the right people in the right places, and we have a really great team. Um, next is a video, and it's, um, I'll let Frank talk about it a little bit. It was something oh, that this was- this is going to be emotional <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> something that- um, Everybody's sworn to secrecy, even though there's a video camera there that will show everybody's emotion. It's interesting when you're- and not knowing. Sorry, go ahead. It's interesting when you're a county commissioner and we as a team have only been together for um, a year and we have the responsibility to work with um, human services. None of us in our previous business life or education have gone out to families, had to deal with all of the things that you know, go on in this you know, um, job. So Dolly had brought Jack and the um, the ladies to kind of bring us up to speed of here's what human services does here's the challenges and and that but Dolly asked us hi it really isn't practical at this time for each commissioner to go out with the people that go out and deal with the families deal with you know the children so they had uh, Dolly had us watch the the um, video we've all heard you know, the latest thing now is reality TV. The video you're going to watch is not reality TV. This is real life, real circumstances. And once we saw this, we had even that much more understanding of what we as commissioners, what we as a community are asking our human services people, um, you know, to do. Once you see the challenges that, and again, a lot of you and all the other organizations that you do, do and work with similar things. But once we saw this, this video, once we went, met with Jack and had a better under, you know, standing, we even had that much more appreciation for the, you know, great work that, you know, Dolly and the team's been doing. So this video is 23 minutes long. Um, if you guys want this presentation, we can email it to you, and there's a link on it, so you can watch the whole video if you'd like. Um, I'm only going to show about five minutes of it right now, so. How long it will be until they get to the whole Or when they'll be able to see Sorry, I'm going to back it up a little. Is, so that would be, I think the hardest part about this work is removing children and not knowing how long it will be until they get to the whole or when they'll be able to see their parents the next time. It was the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Foster care was absolutely terrifying, but 
we were better off because of it. We were in a real bad way when we were brought into the system, and if we hadn't been, we probably would have died. There was two social workers that came to talk to us at the hospital, and they told us not only was our newborn baby not going home with us, but our two children that were currently in our home also not going to be able to go home with us. One of the hardest moments um, as a caseworker was, you know, when I had seen him remove the kiddo, and he was close to my son's age. And I was trying to explain to him why he had to come with me, and he couldn't stay with his mom and dad. I was also pregnant at the time of that. And so I remember just feeling so exhausted because here I left this, this baby and took him to a foster home and he didn't really know where he was, was going. And that was the night that I had to go home and just hug my three-year-old and be there for him that night. And he didn't know what I seen, he didn't know what I had went through. But it was a night where I held him and I remember seeing thinking, you will never know what I see, and you will never experience what some of my kids experience on my kids. I was not allowed to be alone with my children. Um, I couldn't breastfeed my baby. It's supposed to be the happiest time of your life, and it was really bad. What matters most to me about being a supervisor is the support that I can give to my workers. Um, I know what it's like to be a caseworker, and I know how hard it is day in, day out, the fast pace. And if there's anything that I can do to make it easier on my caseworkers, that's my job. Being involved in child welfare is scary. Fear manifests as anger, as blaming, as um, being reclusive and trying to pull away from the situation. For that to get broken up or changed or for you know, the, the department to be involved and, and to have to take your kids away for a portion of time, um, it starts off as fear, which is generally anger towards the person that, that is putting this on you. I've seen caseworkers work with babies and find them homes when parents couldn't overcome their addiction. I see caseworkers who take the middle school kids and, and work with them and find them families. And I think maybe most touchingly sometimes I see the caseworkers who work with our older youth who are going to emancipate out of the system who truly have nobody in their lives, but and the caseworker can be such an important person. It's hard when kids have not specifically been hurt by their parents, um, like physically or even emotionally. Say there's an instance of a parent being arrested and jailed on drugs charges or something else that has never specifically directly impacted the children, and then them being removed from the home and not being able to see their, child, their parents, and the kids just not understanding what's happening. I think that's, and trying to explain it in, you know, kid words and, you know, their developmental level, but it's never easy, no matter how old the kid is. I didn't know at the time what I had done wrong to, to, to deserve this or why, why my mom didn't care to, to, to be there for me. And I just felt hurt most of the time and unwanted. to the questions. I see people probably didn't use their question cards, but if anybody did, you can pass them forward. Did you? This was, well, I didn't. Uh, this was given to me. Oh, okay. Okay. So that was the question she had wanted to answer. Can Health and Human Services refer families to DHS? I think she's meaning Health and Human Services more as in like, like health. us, like public health. 
Okay, can you guys refer people to CCR, the CCR program? Yeah. Yes. As, as my guess is, is on that question. I don't know if she's not here to really explain it for her, so that's our guess, our take on her question. Right, okay, so I'll let So, go. no, the, um, the only way that it's the CCR program, the only way, the way it was set up and designed um, across the board is that it has to come from a DHS uh, abuse or neglect referral that was screened out, unless we've worked with, the, with that particular family before. We are also able to, just so you know, um, with the CCR program, if we close out um, a high-risk assessment or a FAR family assessment response, um, we are able to refer families to the CCR program that way too. So if we do have to intervene and we you know, see that the family may need some additional assistance, but it's not enough to keep keep being involved, then we can refer them to the CCR program, which is an added benefit. So, and we've done that with a couple of families already. Nicole, can you also say if a family came to you and said, we're wanting some services, but I know you guys said it earlier, but to this question, what options are there? Oh, yeah. So we do um, provide PA3 services. So those, um, you know, short term or um, we, we kind of try to monitor it, but if the family needs um, some sort of intervention and they can't provide that themselves, we are definitely willing to open up um, those services. And we've had several families come in and self refer. I mean, I think we've had one or two this week already. <coughs> what intervention? Counseling. So what's the spectrum of interventions? Yep, therapeutic services. So we have a variety. Of so the majority of our families here in Moffat County um, are doing some short-term therapeutic services because they're have, they're struggling um, getting those services paid for in one way or another. Um, they don't qualify for Medicaid and they don't have their own private health insurance. Um, you know, they they can't afford the copay. There's just a variety of reasons the practitioner doesn't take insurance. Um, and the other service that we um, we refer to a lot is our parenting coach. Um, um, she provides parenting, one-on-one -on -one parenting skills and classes. Um, and we have a lot of families who request that service as well. There's also equine therapy. Mm -hmm. Who That's does the one-on-one -on -one parenting? Diane Prefer. Is the PA three dollars only for youth, or can you use them for like family counseling? With Absolutely. So we have, we have families who are involved in parents are receiving services um, as long as there's a child under the age of eighteen. But do families have to have a, a voluntary DHS case in order to take advantage of the PA three services? No, they do not. Um, and actually. Uh, um, the PA3 program is designed so that they specifically don't have to have involvement with us. Any other questions? Why do you think we don't have more foster homes? I know that's a huge issue. Yeah. So, um, so when Nicole and I started our positions, you know, a little over two years ago, we had three certified foster homes. Now we're up to seven, and wow. um, Nicole is actually working with with two current families right now to get them certified. Um, and then I don't know if you guys are aware, but um, a local foster family who adopted was just recognized at the governor's mansion. It was the camps, and they're all over Facebook, and um, we have a lot of recruiting materials for that, so we're hoping um, to get that out, and we're hoping that that'll help us recruit more families also. Are you finding it harder to find, to get foster homes for older kids? Yes, mm -hmm. yes we are. Yep. We definitely have a high need for that. Uh, that's what I need. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a question? Because like, I think Katrina, your question was why is it so difficult to get foster yeah. parents? Not how many do we have now? And how? Because you are doing better, and that's great. But what is the snag in getting them in? Do you know? I think there's a. I think there's a couple things. Um, lack of interest. Um, it's a very um, time-intensive process. There's a lot of requirements that come into play when you are being certified for foster care, and some families just don't want to go through that. Um, and we, we've had that before where we have someone um, meet with us and we explain kind of the process and what that looks like, and then they decide that they just aren't, aren't in a place to um, do all of those requirements. Uh, a lot of times, um, 
we see with foster families, it's very difficult because they're working one-on-one -on -one with the child. They have that child in their home 24-7, um, and that child is impacted by other systems that is making decisions, and they have a, lot, a lack of control. So you've got courts making decisions, you've got, sometimes we have kids who are involved with probation, um, with um, the court system, and um, that becomes difficult. Um, I think, you know, reimbursement, foster parents don't get paid, and they get reimbursed um, to provide for the care of those child, those children, and that's, that, that can be financially difficult, and we try to work with families as best as we can. Um, and I th I'll, I'll be very transparent in that, um, I think several years back, um, the county did not do a great job at um, working with the foster parents and treating them well. And so we're really trying to change that and be um, more attentive to our foster parents' needs because they are our greatest resource. What are some of the qualities that you've noticed in people that do, are making you know, the, the, the greatest and best you know, foster parents, what are? So I would say it's not having the best house, the best, you know, money, but it's the love that they have for the kids and the commitment to um, really seeing those children transform. Um, I will also say another big factor that we have seen help our families be successful are our foster families who want to work with a biological family. Um, that's incredibly helpful for all involved. And I'll be honest, we have a couple foster families who are amazing at that. Um, and we have closed cases and um, the family still reaches out to um, the foster family for support. So they babysit, they have holidays and birthdays together and they've really integrated them into the family. So those have been some of our biggest successes. And, and, um, three years being <laughs> You guys have a tough job, <laughs> but oh, three years being a commissioner, this last Tuesday's meeting was probably the most enjoyable, the most mm -hmm. rewarding, and the most satisfied. The, the whole chambers was full. Here was the, the camp um, family with the, the little boy. He sat through an hour and a half of boring numbers, boring statistics, the kids probably he learned about oil exploration up in North that, and he sat there just so lovingly with that um, family. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Have you guys thought about reaching out to, and maybe you have, and I'm just I'm not aware, but reaching out to the families that have been certified in the past who fell off, basically quit being foster parents because of those reasons you stated, and said, hey, you know. I mean, I'm trying to re reintroduce um, those those families that then they still may be interested, but because they're so scared of how it was and how bad they were treated, that they. Um, there have actually been some that we've reached out to. Um, Dolly has one specifically that she reaches out to. I would bet every day. And you know, I think it's just. Some people are in it for a season and some people are in it, you know, for longer than that. And, um, you know, we try to re-engage and we try to mitigate those concerns and we have reached out to a few. Um, and we've had several that have moved away too. So that's been an issue as well. What supports are offered? Like, I, I know you say that the, it's tough to get um, foster parents for older kids. And I would say that a lot has to do with the struggles that come with that. So. Is there training or tools given to work with? Or so every foster home is required to complete um, training prior to becoming a, a foster parent and then every year thereafter. So the first year there's quite a bit of training and then every year, it's, I think 20 years, I can't remember, off the top, or 20 hours. Um, and we really try to make sure that that training is tailored to the population of children that they're working with um, and they're getting the tools. We have, we're, we're currently um, hiring for a part-time foster care coordinator, um, and she, the position, that position is really built for that person to work with our foster families and really kind of help brainstorm and problem solve when problems or issues come up. So uh, we've currently got that position. And a lot of times foster homes, when they 
do become foster homes or they're looking to get the certification, they have a choice of like the age range that they want. And a lot of times you see people who have hard times making their own families that they really push for the, the infants or like young toddlers because of the trauma and the difficulties that most of the older kids bring. That's at least what I've noticed in our community. And our, our process is really to have those difficult conversations with families and, and determine with them what population of, of child or youth that they're going to work with and what they would do best with. Um, another thing resource-wise that I would say, and I've noticed with our foster families, they really use each other um, and reach out to each other when they need help or assistance because really truly, they're the only ones who understand. I don't, I'm not a foster family. I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't know how that process would work and how it would impact my life. And we have um, several families who do that with each other, so. Do any counties like get grant funding so you can incentivize families or like compensate them for that training? Like are there grants so that you can say like, hey, I know this is like 100 hours of your time, but we can provide you this X money so to help get you through that? We reimburse, the department reimburses for those <coughs> expenses, especially the, mm -hmm. the core expenses for the, the main training that they have to have. It's mileage, the state, we all reimburse mileage, lodging, uh, meals, and if they have children in their home, we'll find respite care for them. And we try to kind of wrap around and mitigate as much as we can. And foster families can also receive the menu of core services while the mm -hmm. child is with them, or, or if they have other children as well as intensive family therapy, home-based intervention, new treatment alternatives. So those those kids and those families are also eligible for all of the new core services, just like any other family that's and, involved. And we do have several foster families who participate in therapy. Um, you know, if they're struggling with a kid, we've hooked them up with a therapist so that they can kind of work on, you know, what is going on with this child and how do we meet their needs. And um, we do have a couple of families that we have done that with. Can I ask them one question? I'll first just I'm trying to help with your clarification. Sure. I think the question might be also worded, do they re are they reimbursed for their time in any way, shape, form, or fashion? Like on an hourly basis, a monthly basis? Do they get a stipend just for their time? Or what is it that reimburses them? So they get kids that are, that are ordered into, into foster care. Um, there are families, yes, that get X number of dollars per day. It depends on the needs. And that's really to go for some it's it's child. Child. So, the child. So it doesn't go to the, the parents, it goes for to take care of the child. So, so the funding source is each child is allocated X amount of day based upon their age, needs, and requirements, mm -hmm. and that money is spent on the child, but it's not designed to reimburse those parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one other question about that. Do you feel like that's any different than any other DHS anywhere else in the state or in the, in the country? Because maintaining and keeping foster families is difficult regardless. So do you feel like it's more challenging here? Um, I think yes and no. I think we have a smaller population, which makes it hard, and I think um, not just within the department. I do think that Moffat County does have some gaps in resources, which makes it difficult for, to fully support families. And um, a lot of our kids who are in congregate care, quite frankly, are there for criminal charges. Um, and I think um, if there had been other supports or services, which is what we're trying to do um, in place, we may have been able to catch them earlier. And so, um, you know, we do have some families who are less inclined to work, especially with our older youth, because of those reasons. Right, and that's, again, pretty standard in mm -hmm. any DHS, right? Insight home with criminal charges with the work mm -hmm. So I was just curious if you had any insight into it. And, and I would say that the struggles that I hear in this community are pretty similar to struggles we hear across the state, um, where, um, it, you know, it's. What we hear from foster parents is we're not feeling supported, we're not feeling like we have the skills to, to manage these behaviors or respond appropriately. Um, and so, uh, and it's really hard um, because it's so dependent on the child and even the interactions of the other children in the home and people's personalities, right? There's a lot there. Um, so the more folks can build in those supports for the in-home therapeutic supports, 
even in foster care. Um, it seems like that's something that yeah, you see that's where the disadvantage is yeah. because of the history. Yeah. Yeah, it's there and it is a small community and that happens quickly. So I was just curious if you thought it was any different than the rest of the state. Yeah, I, I, don't, don't I don't hear anything hugely unique um, by any means. Um, but the gaps in resources don't want me at the struggle. Any other questions? Oh, okay. I have any questions, so I just thought I'd write. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Okay, so what qualifies as an, an immediate response for child protection reports? What is the time, minutes slash hours, uh, the on-call case worker must respond? And the same for adult protection also. So um, immediate, it, we can't just say like this is gonna qualify as an immediate response. There's a lot of factors that go into screening. Um, to screening in our referrals, I think one of the things that we really look at um, is is making sure that um, you know is there immediate danger happening right now and is that child at risk for moderate to severe bodily harm um, and in that case we would most likely respond we do have you know law enforcement that calls and asks us to respond even though it may not be an immediate case and um, I would say 95% of the time we do um, and really truly we try to it meet an immediate response for us and the way we operate um, is eight hours. You have eight back. hours, yeah. Not, not just not yeah. in, but it's just state expectations. So, um, and if we don't make contact, then we have to try every eight hours to see kids. And then adult protection, um, we really don't have a lot of immediate responses here. Um, the guidance that we've obtained is if it's an immediate response, the hospital ambulance needs to be called. And, um, those issues need to be dealt with. We um, primarily, it's three business days. And one thing I would add is the you know the state rules say eight hours. It doesn't mean you have to wait <laughs> eight hours, right? So many many times it's within an hour of receiving a call or something because usually those immediates are really like there is there is an incident happening right now. Um, but and I don't answer. think we've ever waited. Yeah, no, you know, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> 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 Usually yeah, those immediates yeah, happen at like three o'clock in the morning yeah. and we'd rather get it dealt with and and able to get the family and the children situated. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, just to clarify. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, next topics for future community forums. Does anybody have any ideas? What do you want to hear about? What do you want to be educated on? Yes, <laughs> Oh, we, okay, we'll wait. <laughs> Just say, yeah. I, one, one thing Melinda was pushing me when we were talking is the family that was awarded the Governor's Award, would they be willing to talk about their experience and, and share what it's been like for them? Yeah. That's just very exciting. I mean, <laughs> sure so, yes. And Dolly and I have been talking too about these community forums. It, it doesn't have to be just DHS. It can be, you know, United Way or the ISST. I mean, even Climate Management Program. It could be anything you want to hallmark, anything you want to, you know, really highlight in an effort to really work together as a community. So, I mean, welcome any topics of any kind of interest for yep. sure. Yes. I'm going to piggyback on that. Can I just ask a question? How many people in this room work for the county or a county-funded program? Because I don't see a lot of just community people, and I think that's where the, you know what I'm saying? I think there's a lot of questions on this side for the people that don't work in the system, and so they wouldn't be at this meeting. I see a lot of county and, and nonprofits that work with the county. So at what point, is there ever going to be a point, a point that you think that you could incorporate more a community situation and that's what we that's what we try to do we put it out in the newspaper we put it on Facebook we we invite the entire community I, I think part of the problem that I'm hearing coming from the other side is that we have these meetings at 1 to 3 in the day mm -hmm. I, I know I'm taking time away from my business to be here we, 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 we've actually had one in the evening and the feedback that we got was please don't do it in the evening <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is, do you think that there's a way, and I'm asking this for of the commissioner, of reaching out 
to the community that isn't benefiting from your services directly. Do you know what I mean? Because if you don't have the business community and the people that aren't in the system backing you, then where are you at? And I'm having a hard time understanding how we can help, because I was invited to this meeting from the commissioners. I am not looking at it from where you guys are looking at it from. I'm seeing it as the same people in the same system year after year after year over utilizing all of the other systems that we have in place. So I'm asking, are we ever going to look at numbers? Because whenever I ask, and I've asked you directly for the last two years, and I never, we don't get that. And so I'm saying if you want the community support, you might want to find a way to factor them in. Yeah, it's actually very interesting being a liaison to social services. I've gone to probably in the last three years 40, 40 meetings of different things united way the um what's the um minister ministerial group the ministerial group we've had the um opioid <laughs> you know conversation and and that so on that one i think it's really a community issue of how can we get them there is there a new different unique way to get our community um, involved because the question yes. you've asked is not just of social services all of the people that have these meetings we need to get the community involved if there's a new unique idea <laughs> a concept an hour a day or a time and I'm not speaking for everybody here but I'll maybe I will a little I think if there is a different avenue to get more of the community involved I've told Dolly, this story, the, the 40 meetings that I've been at, to I told the um, story before I came to a county commissioner, and I, I'll keep it short, my typical day was go to work, <laughs> go to the grocery store, do some family um, activity, go to church on Sunday. My eyes as a community member were wide open <laughs> The, the, the first week I was a commissioner and started dealing with some of these coming to the meetings. We have a great community with a great heart and we've got great people here that are trying to do great work and yes, that is the goal of getting more of the community in, involved. We have some blinders on in our community of this challenge, this challenge, this challenge, and this challenge and we all know what the challenges are so I would hope someone could, could say is it the day it's the time is it the, the forum how can we get the, you know, the, the, the people involved and I, I will have to say in the last two years that the meetings that I've been to it was like five people 10 15 20 25 30 40 there has been great you know improvement and kudos to all of the people that are um, that are here that is the key to turning around a community is is getting more of the community um in, involved we've all heard the term singing to the choir and i'm not saying that's what your thing is but it's part of the community's responsibility too so i don't know besides invitation so does anybody have any ideas of of how we can get more community involvement because you've all done and, and attempted to get you know more of more people involved I think all you can do is invite put it out put it in like Dolly just said newspaper social media and word of mouth but with all that being said you have to you have to want to come you have to want to know what's going on you can't force people to come so those of us and thank you for taking your time out to come but as far as like making people come that, that's just like telling someone to do something they don't want to do they yeah, don't I want think to come say that the that people don't want to. I, I, that's not what I hear in every day when I'm working with people that aren't involved. I don't think that's it. I don't think it's a, a lack of wanting to. And I just want to be the first one to say that I, it's not. I'm not specifically just saying DHS. I, we've had questions across the board with 
the whole entire system in Moffat County. This is just one little piece of it. So I don't want it to come across like I'm saying, oh, it's just this, because it's not. There are other issues. But I'm saying that, that you're, you're asking the same thing I'm asking. How do we do that? Because I think we're missing a lot of support that we could be tapping. Yeah. And I'm going to say this respectfully. It's easy to ask the, the question. So I'm going to put it back in your ball okay. court. What's your suggestion? Is it time of day? Is it the message? Is it the different media to be used to in, you know, invite the, the people? Because if there was an answer, I think everybody here would love to go it. If there was a formula, A, B, C, D, E, and F, these people would be running out. But, but I, you do, know, yeah. I don't think there's a formula. I don't think it's A, B, C, and D. But I do think when people reach out and ask, rather than shutting that down because it's difficult, maybe maybe addressing some of that, because what's happening, and it's the same thing that Nicole was kind of saying earlier about what's happened in the past is carrying over. And if you try to have a discussion and it gets shut down right there, why, why would you have your friends come? Yeah, right, and again. I mean, with all due respect, in the last few meetings that we have been to, um, and not that this is not an amazing turnout. This, I mean, there was a town hall in Mason County yesterday, and there was less than 10 people there, OK? So I mean, and I mean, there are much larger counties. So we, I, I'm really thankful for everyone who's taken the time to come today. But in the prior community forums, there's, there was education, there was um, schools, there was the hospital, there was the judge was there, there was probation. I mean, it was, there was church, there was ministries. There was communities that didn't, what, didn't really even some identify. We did a big thing on the wall to identify how we're involved in the community. Um, did I did I host somebody's baby shower? Did I take somebody to church with me? Did I, you know, go get somebody's prescriptions? And just how interconnected this entire community was. That that was a lot of people that weren't connected to human services, United Way, public health. And so it's unfortunate that you're seeing maybe um, a lot of maybe saturation here, and maybe the maybe an answer could be instead of doing community forums or town halls maybe a brown bag lunch, because everyone's got to have lunch, right? And so a brown bag lunch topic, or hot talk, or TED talk, or Moffat talk, or whatever you want to call it, and you know, feature the foster parents that won the award one month, and then that next month have Department of Education host it during the summer, where they're not in, you know, so everyone has a best interest in hosting one of these Moffat talks during lunch, and then everyone has the time to come if they want to come, right? I, I, I'm just asking. I don't know sure. the answer. No, not at all. I didn't, I didn't take it that way. What I'm saying is, I, I, I feel like if, if we're not tapping into that now when we have such a small community, and it is a small community, we are in a really good position to actually make some of this stuff happen. And if we're not tapping into the other people that can support it, then we're kind of. Amanda, I think you had a question. Actually, I just was going to say, I think part of the problem that we have in this community, um, and, and I just with communities of care, um, for those of you guys who don't know, I also do um, facilitate Moffat County Hope, which is the heroin and overdose prevention and education team. Um, and I see things here, and I think the foster care problem, and that's the one that's, the, sorry, I'm kind of focused on at the moment, uh, but is, is a lack of education, right? So we have, a, we have a situation of the others, right? That doesn't affect me, that's those other people, and that happens in a lot of the things that we work with. Um, same thing, like, we don't have a drug problem, right? Because that's, that's not my family, that's another's problem. Um, and I think here, it's the same thing, like, I don't think people understand how many, I mean, not that it's a lot, right? But how many of our kids need to be put in the foster homes? How many of our kids are having to be, because of other situations, it could be drugs, it could be whatever, crimes, um, and how many are having to be sent out of the area because they have to go into congregate? And I think it's an education thing too. Like, if people don't know, and then and it has to be connected to the economic side, right? So we have, we are sending X number of kids, eight kids out of our community, and it's costing our community $51,000 a month. That might, I mean, just that alone, some people, I mean, truly, I think some people are, would, are then some people start to take notice. Like, if that was an ad, if I open that newspaper. And it's bad for kids. Our exactly. Our community forum was on that very topic. But you know what I mean, but I'm saying, but, and, and I understand the community, but it has to be almost done, I mean, I hate to say it, nowadays it's got to be done through social media, right? Like, it needs to be an ad that pops up in my Facebook feed that says, did you know, like, come to the next, 
I mean, maybe that's more of the way to get people involved in events like this is that because all of a sudden they're like, whoa, wait a minute, I, Craig's dying, right? That's what I hear all the time, Craig's dying, right? So Craig's dying, well, Barnabas, we're spending $600,000 a year, we're paying to Douglas County or wherever because they're housing our kids in congregate care. Well, that's huge, like in my mind, that's a lot of money that could be being spent here, right? And us being able to get that two for one ratio. Um, you know, it's the same with, I mean, look at the what happened here with the coal mine. You know, when something started threatening a major employer here, how many people came together and did something about that because, you know, there was economic proof showing that for every coal mine job we had, six other jobs in this community were directly tied to that. Well, it's the same thing where we have to show that the economic impact, and I think it's, I think it's an education piece, like getting it out to people saying, do you realize the financial and economic burden that this is causing? that you guys have no idea. I mean, it's the same thing with we do with Hope, with the heroin. Do you know that the hospital is spending X number of millions of dollars a year dealing with overdoses and having to fight that because they're the ones that are having to deal with, the, you know, with getting people to come down? Do you know the possibility? You see, and that's kind of our push right now with some of these other things that we're doing. And I think for this system, it's the same thing where we really need to be educating the masses on more than just the I mean, it's got to be more, right? You've got to figure out all the ways that, that people are going to read, and that's the, the economic one. I mean, that speaks to people. I mean, it's money, right? Now you say that's six hundred thousand dollars of your tax dollars, right? That's going out. Like that's that's your money. That's your sales tax. That's your property taxes. That's your that's going. Yeah. With your permission, not that we would do it, and we could always retape it. That message needs to get out in the community. So not that this is the venue to do it, but that that emotion, that presentation, and it hits you in the in the face and gets their um, attention. It, it is it is a positive message because you need to get their attention so that we as a community can help you know solve it. I mean, I wish we could just put that on. <laughs> 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 It's yes. not just our house. Mm -hmm. this, this whole place is our community. Her kids or my kids or our kids. You know, you can't just live in a bubble saying it's not happening in my house. So I, I, I really don't need to take the time yeah. because you know what? You do. Your kids have friends that are going to come into your home that are going to become your kids too. I mean, because they're buddies and stuff. And that's what we've lost here is our sense of community. I, that one that you mentioned that was actually the, whatever it is room 175 I wish we would have videotaped that because there was the connection and the stories of how just what you said we're all interrelated we're all inner you know um, dependent there's nothing to say we can't do it again you know new players new time and space new you know people at the table it's nothing to say because it was very empowering I think it, people were shocked at how interconnected everyone really is, but not to lose that momentum and to continue on that message of interconnectivity and, and sense of community, right? Well, and building up the positive instead. I mean, mm -hmm. because uh, we've got the camps now. We can, like, make that known and kind of build that up and their success and how it felt to them to be honored and to be able to give. And I am a former foster mother, and I'm still keeping up with foster children that have graduated now from college and, and talk to me, and their families too, and it's very satisfying. And so maybe if we start finding avenues to get out the positive and just kind of have those uh, kind of a little bit of flood in that way, and just that you can, you can qualify too. I mean, it's craziness too, but it's a part of life. It's a roller coaster. Can, yep, can I just ask a question real quick? A couple of questions, actually. How many people, and just to show you, how many people have kids at the high school? Is in high school? Just four? So, my other problem. What about the middle school? I'm sorry, what did you say? Middle school. What about the middle school. Because one of the avenues that I was thinking of, because I don't have any kids in school here, um, has anybody heard of Motley County Prep? Yeah. Okay, if you've heard of Motley County Prep, just raise your hand. I mean, I've, I've heard of it. Yeah, so Motley County Proud, um, Kip Hakey, and um, who's the English teacher? Francis Grant. So they they do 
they do lots of things with within the high school and the kids, and, and it's not just the sports, but it's the things that the kids are doing. So maybe that's an avenue. So if, if you don't have kids in school, but you've heard of Moffitt County Proud, and if we could, you know, it would be a way to help them take their program a step farther by helping us bring our programs closer to the community. So it's a that's an excellent off. idea. I've worked with them before, and that's. I mean, they're all about they're all about the kids they're all about highlighting the kids they're all about highlighting the things that are going on and the things that can help the community it's just maybe we need to help them increase their venue by helping us increase ours one thing on, on the connect the dots which was yes. what the mm -hmm. activity you did it's um so the, the national one nationwide um, activity that folks are doing and so it could be something where like a church could do it in there within their church um, and like a, a business community because I, I really want to highlight the business community I think that they uh, that's something I don't know that I've seen a lot of in any of the community forums maybe a couple but that's one that you could probably connect to more um, but they could um, you know they if there's a I know better, better business group that meets. I don't know. Don't look, I'm a social worker. I don't even do words for business, but <laughs> if they meet together, right, they could do their own connected dots and really be thinking about how do I help support child safety, right? So anytime a business has an employee who stays employed with them long term, that's creating child safety. Uh, and so maybe you know, encouraging folks um, and connecting the dots was a really easy activity to do. Um, and so you know, I could connect with whoever to help. Could we have the world's largest connect the dot thing? I mean, make it yeah. fun, make it interesting, make it exciting, make it dynamic, where even if you don't have a base level interest in this, you want to be part of what the community is 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 doing. Yeah. I mean, the thing that felt to me about when it, when it was done here is I saw light bulbs go on for people. Like there was one guy I remember so clearly. He was like, I don't have any kids. I don't work with kids. <laughs> Um, none of my friends have kids. And he's like, oh, but wait, I live in a cul-de-sac, and literally every time I drive in my cul-de-sac, I slow down, right? And it was a sort of this light bulb, like, oh, actually, I do impact the lives of kids every single day. So I think just participating in it does create that sense of, oh, this is, this, it does create some of some energy. Um, so that might be a way to not needing everybody to be together at once, but pockets of people having similar conversations. Um, because, yeah, I, I love Nicole's reaction, right? You do it at night, people complain about night, you do it during the day. Like, you can't win, so how do you do it in lots of different places, right? Because the reality is we all need it in different ways. Um, and it's not always just you just putting yeah. it on. There's been, I think, I had time three or four, and it's just the different resources or whatever is, like, pressing at that time. Or whatever somebody wants to get out. And, yeah. Colorado helped it on. Yeah. and if you're looking for something to get the economic impact in there, you know, what, what meetings are the commissioners doing that are the, discussing with the community economic in, economic impact that we can bring our information to the community through your mm -hmm. platform? Excellent point. Yes. Well, I just want to say um, this was really enlightening today, so I really appreciate everything. Um, but I also think that it's important to realize that kind of what Susie said, our community starts within us. And what are we going to do to educate more people in our community about issues within it? And it's easy for me to put on um, every organization, including mine, of what I need to do better. But I think each of us needs to do better about communicating and talking to people and um, telling their circle, because then those circles tell other circles. Um, and then maybe that's how we can also improve that. Um, because this information is really good information that's enlightening for me to see um, what you guys are dealing with every day um, even more than what I do see so thank you so is there anybody that really wants to volunteer to post the next one Chelsea looks cool excited about that talk to our commissioner buddies I'll talk to our city council <laughs> and and that i think we just need to make it bigger better more fun and exciting and i do like the idea of, of the, the pockets but <coughs> yeah, it's a great idea thank you
So um, here's the poll. You have to ask for volunteers to help. Oh. <laughs> Who would like to help Frank? <laughs> and I think that's an and that's an example right there of where we all get caught up into our own time. Mm -hmm. You know, we Frank needs help to organize something or needs assistance in getting the word out, whatever it is. But I mean, we're we're all here. When we leave here, we all have families. We all have 900 other things that to do. Some of us have to drive an hour. But you know, it's it's. Everybody has their own priorities, and until it becomes a priority within the community itself, there probably won't be. It'll, 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 baby steps are baby steps, but that's what you're going to come to see initially. It's just baby steps. If there was a serious question, I'll help. Thank you. I, can help. <laughs> I, I didn't know you were serious. I thought it was the same council and your, the other council or the other chairman. I was like, oh, I thought it was something. But I'll help. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk with the other commissioners, see what resources we can bring. I mean, as far as people involved, getting the, the word, the message out. So. Stephanie? And Northwest Colorado Health will help participate. And when I said collaborative management, I didn't mean I said I didn't mean necessarily that you do all of that. I was actually offering an intern under the bus, um, our coworker Tiffany Sewell, yeah. because collaborative <laughs> management does have the ten mandatory partners, which is really ten crux of really important systems mm -hmm. that are mandated partners to to be involved. But they're really the foundation of really what every child, what every family touches in this community. So that wouldn't be a bad idea. That I wasn't and I can reach out to her. She's coming in March. Yes. So um, maybe yeah. we can. Yeah. Especially if you have an IS or an IOG meeting we do. already, and, and she's going to come. Tag, tag that onto that. Yeah, we can. So I will reach out to her. And it doesn't need to be me either. Someone just nobody raise their hand. I think you have a great idea, and I think there's people willing to help. So I think it's good. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, that's all we have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys.